Thank you very, very much for coming this evening uh, to this uh, first uh, TORCH event of the new term. Um, my name is Elika, Elika Burma, and I'm the director of TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. And at TORCH, what we do is we promote, we support, we encourage interdisciplinary research in the humanities. We have a number of different networks and programmes and series running at any one time. Do visit our website and have a look at everything that we get up to and that you're all very, very much uh, warmly invited to be part of and to attend. So as I was already anticipating, tonight is the opening event in our digital, uh, sorry, our Humanities and the Digital Age series, which is very kindly supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We're very grateful to them for their support. The series will explore areas of convergence between the humanities and the digital, broadly described, and consider digital's at once creative and disruptive potential, and imagine the future territory to be prospected in this 21st century that we are all deeply inside already. We look forward to an exciting year of collaborations across the university and beyond. And what I'm now going to do is hand over to Dame Lynn Brindley, who will be chairing this evening and will introduce the speakers on the panel and open the discussion. Lynn Brindley is the Master of Pembroke College here at Oxford, and she was formerly Chief Executive of the British Library. There at the British Library, she, um, under her aegis, um, she embraced the challenge of shaping and developing an important historical institution, the BL, for the modern and digital era. So there could be few more appropriate people to uh, chair this panel than Dame Lynn. Thank you very much. So Elika, thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a really great pleasure um, for me to be chairing this opening event tonight on what I think you all know is such an important and topical theme um, for all of us, actually, whether we're in the university, uh, in cultural roles, in schools, or simply as citizens and human beings. And indeed, whether many of you are digital natives or rather like me, a digital immigrant. Um, so my role as chair uh, is to I'm just going to explain a little bit about the format of the e evening, introduce the speakers, um, and uh, take questions from you all um, for the panel. And I think most importantly, I have to end you on time so that you can go and have a drink um, and continue the conversations informally. Um, so each of our speakers is going to give a short presentation. We're going to run through four presentations in the order uh, that people are seated there. Uh, and then we're going to take questions and have discussion. Now we're live streaming the event with viewers joining, we think, around, from around the world. And uh, may I could say a particular welcome to all of those uh, remotely connected um, to us. And you are also invited to contribute questions um, from the uh, text feed. And we will hope to pick up a question or two um, from that stream. Um, I'm delighted now to move on to our speakers um, and to just introduce them briefly. Um, the first up speaker will be Chris Fletcher, who many of you will already uh, know. Um, He's a professorial fellow at, Ox uh, at Exeter College. He's a member of the English faculty and keeper of special collections at the Bodleian Library, where he's responsible for the most amazing array of materials, Western manuscripts, Oriental special collections, rare books, maps, music, and the university archives. And before coming to Oxford in 2006, he was the curator of literary manuscripts um, at the British Library. And I always think, um, Chris, yours is probably one of the dream jobs in the world that we all envy you. Um, and I think having glimpsed the Mark of Genius exhibition 
um, we kind of know the taster of the extraordinary riches of the Bodleian collections. So Chris is going to explore the continuing interest in the analog form. Um, you know, our books getting a revival. Um, the vibrant cultures of digital in libraries and the importance and increasing challenges of digital preservation. And by preservation, I think Chris will mean for the hundreds of years, um, not the few years. Um, our second speaker, second up, is going to be Emma Smith. Emma is a fellow and tutor of English at Hartford College, and her, and her work focuses on Shakespeare, his contemporaries, and his reception. And she's currently working on a cultural biography of Shakespeare, um, first folio, uh, right through from 1623 to the 21st century. Um, Emma, I'm amazed you can find time for us this year, particularly. Thank you for that. 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death. Uh, there's just a bewildering array of activities and celebrations this year. And Emma's going to focus on the digital archive and forgetting. So we've already got preserving and forgetting. Uh, and after Emma, we're going to have Diane Lee speaking. Diane is the Director General of the Imperial War Museum Group uh, and is cultural lead for the centenary of the First World War um, program, cultural program. Um, Diane, it's wonderful to see you here in Oxford. It's been my privilege when I was in London uh, to be able to work with you, alongside you. And Diane, I can assure you, is one of our great museum leaders. Um, she happened most recently, I don't think she'll mind me saying, to have hit the headlines um, by comments on how museums are reaching capacity in their ability to handle endless school trips, which of course are welcome, but not always welcome when every school child is clutching a clipboard um, and a worksheet. I think she feels there are other ways to reach into history beyond the clipboard. Um, but Diane is going to explore the questions that we pose from the perspective of the museum and heritage sector. And to some extent, the word I would use is about remembering so we've got forgetting and remembering and <coughs> preserving. And then we go on to our final speaker, Tom Chatfield. Um, and Tom is a British author and broadcaster. Some of you may have seen his great article in The Guardian this morning. Uh, and he's got six books, most recently, How to Thrive in the Digital Age. And I think we should all perhaps read that and also live this book. And they're published, his books are published in over 30 languages. And he's a faculty member of the School of Life in London, but he was here, did his doctorate at St. John's College. And I'm delighted to hear that he's working um, at the moment on a book much needed, I would think, or with Sage publishers on critical thinking in the digital age. And I suspect this ought to be required reading mm -hmm. for all undergraduates um, when it uh, comes out. So Tom also, um, in his recent tweets, reflected on one or two things like, how would he feel if his two-year-old son, and congratulations to your recent, uh, um, your, your new daughter, never held a physical book so if information in his world or her world was only and always on screen. And he also reflected on how our phones and other digital temptations, or one might even say distractions, are ruling our thoughts and attention spans. So he's going to in, uh, explore the technology, how it connects us, how machines are taking on more and more of our tasks, um, and indeed, predictions from academics here in Oxford about robots taking over at least probably 40% of our jobs in the next few years. Uh, and so then to pose the real question um, about what it means to aim beyond efficiency, if you like, at lives worth living. So you can see we have a great lineup tonight, but no more ado from me. Um, 
I think can we move then, Chris, to you as our first speaker. Thank you. Oops. Oh. Oh, there was a keyboard. <laughs> Here we are. OK, well, good evening. The Bodleian recently launched a festival celebrating drawing. As part of this, the artist, Tamarin Norwood, retreated to our printing workshop, turned off her devices, and learned how to set type. She proceeded in her inky and delightful way to compose a series of print tweets. At the end of the day, she launched Twitter and shared with the world what she had done. For the eight hours she was offline, it must have felt lonely being digital in our human age. The shadows of the digital have us looking, even longing for the tangible. We seek to embrace what the artist and poet David Jones described as the actually loved and known. I see the implications of this every day in the Western Library, where we house almost 40 kilometres of rare and unique material. We teach increasingly from objects to satisfy the academic and student appetite for material culture. While we digitise in order to share collections and offer practical surrogates, we remain alive to the demand for the artefact which digitisation often stimulates. A scholar re recently requested access to a collection of children's games, images of which were readily available. How otherwise, she argued, could she assess patterns of use? Our exhibitions draw larger and larger crowds, and our reading rooms have never been busier. Indeed, last year, across the Bodleian libraries as a whole, we saw a 7% increase in physical visits. When pursuing new acquisitions from specialist dealers, we have to compete harder and faster with peer institutions. It's a relief when, when an electronic sale catalogue lands in the inbox first thing in the morning because it gives me a jump on sleeping competitors across the pond. And uh, if you're watching this, I know you're not buying. The print catalogue, interestingly, continues to thrive despite its declining commercial utility. The things get, that get snapped up the quickest are those which, if you like, have a concentrated thingness. We recently had to fight hard at auction for a copy of John Aubrey's Miscellanies, annotated by his friend Robert Hooke. Thankfully, we didn't have to compete for a recent donation of over 1,500 games and puzzles, dating from as early as 1791. The public interest generated by this collection has been considerable. People at the moment can visit our current display of a selection of these, including Suffragetto, an apparently unique strategy game of 1917 in which police and suffragettes compete to take control of the Albert Hall and the House of Commons. <laughs> Outside the library, we see vibrant sales of vinyl and a wide variety of 35mm film. The audio streaming service, Spotify, now offers its subscribers its own version of the mixtape, that old-fashioned way of anthologising music, often as tokens of friendship or love. Digital algorithms are seeking to emulate the human heart. People demand the online stuff, but they cherish what's offline. It's interesting looking at trends in our legal deposit intake, that is, the books that UK publishers are obliged to send us under legislation. They can elect to send copies electronically now, and an increasing number do so, particularly academic publishers. Oxford University Press, bless it, sends in both formats. But alongside the rise in electronic deposit, we are seeing a renaissance in new titles with high production values and alluring often self-referential design. Those slyly nostalgic ladybird books for adults could never be given away or received for Christmas digitally. I got um, midlife crisis, by the way, and uh, <laughs> it's now with Oxfam. 
A satisfaction in the durability and relevance of the analogue does not, of course, mean that the opportunities and challenges represented by the digital should not be fully embraced. Our digital stock across the libraries is on the increase, purchased as well as deposited, and we have a particular responsibility to meet the needs of those researchers whose library spaces are defined more in the virtual than the physical sphere, and whose texts are streamed rather than bound. But if some forms of content are shifting towards the electronic, digital also enables new means for the interpretation of the analogue materials we continue to value so much. We recently announced the acquisition of a long-lost poem by Percy Shelley, printed in Oxford in 1811, but never actually seen until the only known copy resurfaced in 2006. In order to protect its commercial potential, absolutely locked into its analogue status, the dealer handling it embargoed any form of access. When we finally got hold of it, we were able to digitise and encode it and offer it up freely to the impatient world. Such enabling opportunities abound. We are undertaking mass digitisation of Greek and Hebrew manuscripts at the moment to add to the millions of images already shared. We teach electronic editing of documents and seek ways to exploit, exploit increasingly sophisticated innovations. For example, using image match technology to trace genealogies of print and, at some point we hope, to identify and collate handwriting spread across a large corpus of material. We have one poem that we know is in the hands of John Donne. Using this technology across a corpus of digitised images, might we find some sleepers elsewhere in the collection? Facilitating this deeper understanding of the analogue through innovative, di innovative digital tools forms an increasingly important element of our work. But I want to come back to and conclude with the question of digital content and in particular the challenge of its preservation. Early on, artists and writers seized upon the new media's potential to subvert notions of permanence embodied in the book form and enshrined by collectors, curators and librarians. One of the most notable examples is Agrippa, a book of the dead. This project, dating from 1992, was a collaboration between the writer William Gibson, the artist Dennis Ashbaugh, and the publisher Kevin Bigos. Their intention was to create a physical book whose images were designed to fade, so the image that you see uh, on the left is one example, um, and whose embedded floppy disk, and you see its, its, its coffin on the facing page, um, uh, played a poem uh, which et itself as it scrolled along. Uh, you see here that the typographical structure imitates that of the Gutenberg Bible, although the text, in this case, gives us the genetic makeup of the fruit fly. Satisfyingly, the experiment was not wholly successful. <laughs> the self-immolating verse escaped onto the web. The ink-fading technology was never, I think, achieved beyond prototype. And collectors, curators and librarians now carefully conserve examples of the very book intended to mess with their heads. Our two copies were generously presented by Kevin Bigos a few years back and exert a powerful presence in seminars on material culture. The digital obsolescence Agrippa set out to achieve has, of course, been happening on a massive scale. And I echo an observation made recently by Vint Cerf of Google that unless we all ramp up our efforts to capture, preserve and make accessible the born digital traces we increasingly generate, future historians are going to struggle. In particular, I'm thinking of the sorts of materials we would term special collections in the analogue world. Ephemera, corporate records, correspondence, diaries and archives detailing our social networks. It's interesting to note that just this week, Friends, Re Friends Reunited wound up business. What is happening to the data accumulated by that social network? Perhaps through its re-matchmaking, the very genesis of some of the children in the creche generously provided for by this event. 
We collect the archival paper record of Oxfam, some 10,000 boxes and counting. But the accruals of material are, in, are increasingly electronic. The collections of contemporary scientists come with data sets and their correspondence usually exists only in the, in the cloud. We can trace the history of the Marconi company through the physical records we hold. But where do we look to explain the financial crash from the inside out? How do we reconstruct the electronic unfurling of the Arab Spring? Well, the Library of Congress has recently risen to the challenge of collecting Twitter, and we must see how that works out. The Bodleian made a start some while back. We harvest websites and extract emails and files from obsolete hardware. We are training up a new generation of digital archivists equipped to make incursions into the ether. But there is a great deal more to do. <coughs> I accept to some degree the Darwinian position that what will last will last and acknowledge that the delete button can be a valuable friend. But as the present rages with debate about what we choose to remember or forget of the past, I still believe we need to leave the, I still believe we need to leave the future something to think about think about. After all, we're curious, human. Thank you. My talk is about uh, theatre and digital archives. But I start with uh, a case from neuroscience. In 2005, three U US neuroscientists published a case study in the journal NeuroCase. AJ, a 40-year-old woman identified as a superior rememberer, was plagued by memories both of her own life and of public events. Her particular feat of recall was not, as previous literature on uh, exceptional memory had found, it was not about strings of numbers or uh, random facts, or indeed the ability to recite continuous prose. Rather, A.J. remembered all kinds of things that had happened to her and when they had happened. And she also recalled a range of emblematic public events, things like the dates of the death of Elvis, if indeed he died, J.R. and Princess Diana. It's probably my own literary training but when I read this account, it seemed a perfect metonym, a kind of update of Borges' 1940 story, Funes the Memorious, the peasant who was cur cursed with perfect recall after a head injury falling from his horse. The discussion of AJ's memory never mentions this, but it seemed clear to me that her overactive memory was structured like the internet, personal moments, as Apple and Twitter like to call them, tagged to Wikipedian facts about who died when and how. The researchers named this exceptional case hyperthymestic syndrome, from the Greek thymesis, remembering. Now, AJ's situation may indeed be remarkable, but it's clear we all live in the age of hyperthymesis. Memory has become for all of us prosthetic, a kind of hard drive or external cloud storage system. And that our ready recourse to the digital has made certain forms of human memory obsolete, telephone numbers, for example, who remembers those? This has often been discussed. But what I want to try and talk about for a few minutes this evening is about something we all know, that the paradox of the digital future is the burden of the past we are spending so much time archiving. And I want to use the theatre as a particular medium to talk about this. Because theatre is a live medium, it tells us something about how to be alive. And therefore, I think its particular attitude to archiving and to memory has some wider implications. Industry statistics show us that almost all theatres are working towards digitally preserving and archiving live content. 
78% of theatres in 2015 use digital means to preserve performances. Most are working towards the capture of live productions, making them available in ongoing form online. The theatre archive, typically in analogue form, an assortment of paper which might include scripts, designs, show reports, sometimes costumes, props or other material recollections of the play on stage. This, like so many other aspects of our lives, is going digital and in, its in the process its focus is being radically expanded. Digitally filmed trailers are a routine part of theatrical production. Storified collections of tweets and other social, medias, uh, social media reactions and the new theatrical form of digital programmes, these are all being recorded and preserved for future generations. Theatre companies now think about producing material in order to be able to archive it rather than archiving the material they're producing. The theatre archive becomes a kind of primary performance, inseparable from the event it allegedly records. Now in this archival process, the word live is under some ontological pressure. Live streaming of theatrical events into cinemas is morphing inexorably towards the specific blocking of productions so that they look good on camera. Routine encore showings now make clear that formerly live events are of course in fact recorded. And perhaps DVD productions advertised as recorded live bring out the paradox. The more I think about it, recorded live would be my shortest answer to the question what does it mean to be human in the digital age? Looking over a similar revolution in representational technologies, Walter Benjamin observed elegiacly, even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. Theatre, we might say, is the one art form that has most retained what Benjamin called aura, the unique existence within time and space, liveness, living. But the implications of recorded live make clear how much that's changing. The availability of recorded theatre online has increased exponentially over the last two years. I think within the next two, all theatre productions will be available online. So how does this fit with excessive memory, with cultural hyperthymesis? Writing about something similar in the area of pop music, Simon Reynolds suggests that contemporary music is completely clogged up by what he calls <coughs> retromania, the endlessly easy online availability of its past. He says suggestively, History must have a dustbin, or history will be a dustbin, a gigantic, sprawling garbage heap. So much of our discussion about the future potential of the digital sphere is about how it will better enable us to record the past. The paradox is clear, the defining characteristic of being human in the digital age is that of being overwhelmed by the past. And the threat to our creative present and future is that the past becomes too omnipresent for us to move forward. Enter the creative potential of forgetting. The so-called right to be forgotten uh, is usually associated with the rights uh, to uh, excise drunken photographs, participation in uh, incautious activities such as Nazi orgies and so on, uh, <laughs> and to have these expunged from the digital record. So uh, th the idea of forgetting is tinged with a sense that what you have done uh, ought really to be forgotten. But I think it's something that we could think about more widely in the cultural sphere. Rather than always looking to record and archive, we might want to reinstate the, un the, la the idea that theatre requires us being in the same place and the same time. More theatres might want to experiment with digital forms that are not just recorded live, but are a different, distinct art form that might again exist only in real time 
and not in the archive. The vast majority of theatres are involved in digital archiving. A tiny proportion are exploring digital theatre production as a standalone form. At the moment, theatre is being changed by, rather than changing, the digital. The best theatrical experiences, I think, are the ones we have half forgotten, even the ones that were really good, where subjective highlights have crystallised in inauthentic but highly personal tableaus of remembrance. Forgetting, half remembering, is one way we collude with art to make it our own. Going back to the experience of encountering it is no more possible than going back to any other kind of experience. Because theatre is live, it teaches us something about being in the present moment. And therefore, its own attitude to the archive tells us imp something important about what live and living might mean. So I've used the theatre as an example of the negative aspects of something which is a much wider phenomenon, the phenomenon of recorded live. And more widely to gesture towards the deadening hand of keeping everything, recording everything for posterity. We don't have time to watch this stuff now. Why would anybody in the future? <laughs> it's not only, I think, those things that we regret that have the right to be forgotten. My academic work is on Shakespeare. And I do observe in conclusion that it may just be because we have allowed ourselves to forget how Shakespeare originally looked that we're still able to do it 400 years later. Remembering, not forgetting, is the enemy of creative reinvention. Not everything that is live should be recorded. Thank you. Gosh, I just had a, a moment of, of intangible and tangible heritage and the challenges. I'm not going to rewrite it as I speak. So, um, uh, the, 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 Imperial War Mo huh. the Imperial War Museum, at the heart of it, really has this essence of that we are about human behaviour. We're about humans at their most extreme, be it creativity or innovation or self-destruction or the destruction of others. And so to have a conversation about what it is to be human and extend that into the digital age is, has been a fascinating challenge for the museum. And, um, uh, you know, sort of building on, on, on Chris's work around digital preservation and our digitisation strategies and all of those things, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk about now. I want to talk about a few cases studies of uh, examples and where the museum has ventured into digital territory in order to help people remember and in order for the museum to operate uh, for different audiences and audiences uh, that are increasingly global and increasingly expecting a 24-7 service. So um, uh, this is warts and all. I know it's been streamed live. So I'm going to start with our biggest disaster digitally and kind of move on to what we consider to be two of our digital successes. So um, we decided to, to, um, to do some research work and, and uh, were very successful in getting a grant from Nesta to look at social interpretation in the galleries. So how people might interact differently with the objects within our narratives, within our, in our gallery spaces. And at the time, this is 2011, at the time it was on the basis of not really knowing what people's personal responses to significant obje objects might be. So we had a whole series of uh, kiosks, uh, a whole series of QR codes, um, things for your uh, mobile phone, um, and uh, we tried uh, to work with audiences uh, on, on their response to the object. What we got and I really don't want people to see this as me being biased against school kids, but what we got was, hi mum, typed into the social inter interpretation sphere. Now, mum might be great, and that's not a criticism of mum, but to us, it was not the response that we were looking at. And the time that it took to mediate what was being put into the galleries when we were asking questions about, um, how would you feel about putting your baby in this gas mask? you know, what's the significance of this object to your family history, all of those questions. It became an exercise in over-mediating um, comments in, in, in multiple languages. The other thing is that we, we make great assumptions about how audiences want to use 
digital technology. And actually, if you look at where we've been successful, it's because we are just simply using digital as a tool. Humans have used tools for a lot longer than the Imperial War Museum and the Bodleian has existed, and uh, they continue to do so. And we need to respect that sophistication that people will use digital tools that are actually useful to them. So we started on this journey of saying, right, OK, um, we want you to be able to um, uh, take some information from the gallery on your mobile phone and follow up on your research inquiries when you get home. That was also the, t the number of people who actually did that was in their hundreds. And given the fact that the main site um, and Imperial War Museum North combined visitor figures of 2.3 million, um, it, was a, it was a response in the low hundreds. So we're not doing that anymore. So that first foray into working with digital in the galleries within quite strong narrative context, I think is not the way in which uh, we can, uh, as a museum, could engage successfully um, uh, in, in the digital sphere. So we moved on to that. And we moved on to a, a number of projects um, that are about uh, engaging people in remembering so the first project is being where digital is being used to make humans feel more human. And we get a lot of a kind of emotional response to the, the projects that we do and to our galleries and to our narratives. And as we are a museum about personal stories, we use that central premise that this was about gathering personal stories to create a project called Lives of the First World War. So we set out with this ambitious target. The Imperial War Museum is nothing if not ambitious. And we set out with the target of, of recording 8 million lives by the end of 2018. Um, and that was the lives of people who'd served either on the serving front or on the home front uh, from, the, from, from the British Empire. And I use that term as a historical one, not another ambition of the Imperial War Museum. Oh, it's so glad you get it's so great that because you're still with me. I'm sorry. I'm always I always have this moment where I think, you know what? I think must be really bored with me by now. But anyway, I'm going to keep going. So so that whole thing around um, around creating assets that make people identify with each other in the digital sphere, I think, is one of the most interesting areas that we can look at, because whilst we have got people walking down the street, engaging individually on their phone, actually, they still have an amazing desire to be part of a group to be part of a social interaction. And we have used that as the basis in which design lives of the First World War. The great news is that it has been such a phenomenal set success. Uh, we are now at 7.6 million lives on that website, where you can track what happened to people, where they came from before the war. We have two and a half thousand community projects where uh, community groups have put together part of their pals battalion or the history of their street um, or the names from their uh, from their war memorial and it's an amazing um, a very structured database you have to prove your sources there's no there's no telling the family myth in this one and and we want to use it to be able to mine it for research because actually what's lacking in research from the first world war is actually what happened to people when they came back because not everybody died, and that's the other part of having lives of the First World War, is that actually not everybody died. And that was one of our objectives, is to say lots of people came back and lived great lives. Otherwise, a lot of us actually probably wouldn't be sitting in this room if they had all died. So it's been an amazing success. And um, some of the collections have been based on the museum kind of uh, seeding um, those databases and using a whole range of partnership sources that I have to be, uh, say have been shared incredibly generously from the National Archives, from um, uh, the Red Cross, um, from partners across um, other museums across the globe, um, our partners at Te Papa in New Zealand, the Australian War Memorial, etc. Um, so it's a very generous uh, database. But also what it's, what it's done is we cannot continue to take in all of the material that sits behind those eight million lives. But, so it allows people to, up, to upload photographs. And I think for us, if you, if you look at the official record, the paper record, uh, from a human perspective, it is literally rank, serial number, conduct, facial recognition, you know, had a tattoo or all of these things. What's really making a difference to that database is families adding the photographs, where those people in remembrance terms are, are coming back to life in, in, in a contemporary context. 
The other thing that we've done is uh, a project around the American Air Museum in Britain that we run in, in Duxford, which is based on a collection that we bought um, of photographs of the US Air Force operating in Britain, um, and particularly at, at Duxford. And that has a much more wiki approach. It, it's much less controlled. It's a much less structured. And one of the really interesting things about the information that's going on that site is it does allow the family story. So for example, we had, um, we had one chap that the daughter actually identified him in the photograph, uploaded the information. But the most poignant thing for me is that she took time to write about her father's battle with um, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, post the end of the war. And for a museum that is, co is, is talking about the consequences of conflict, those anecdotes, those family responses are equally as important as an inventory record that shows us where that original source is. And it comes with risks. And that's the other thing about any public engagement, crowdsourcing, digital project, is it comes with the risk that the information isn't always perfectly accurate. And, uh, you know, sort of, we do, and because we do allow the family myth, some of that I think even families might, might start to dispute. So I, I think what we I think what we're saying is that that uh, you know sort of human uh, humans are using digital with us as a, as another form of engagement in the same way that they would come to the museum. So we now have you know there are eighty thousand members of the lives of the First World War project, um, but there are uh, you know a hundred thousand contributors uh, uh, facts added every month to to that database it means that we have a new community that is that is is working with the Imperial War Museum that we never would have reached before. Um, so I think that whole thing about humans using tools is, I have one quick more example, are you looking at me to say one minute, sorry. Um, the other thing that I can do is talk, if you haven't noticed, <laughs> very bad at timekeeping. Um, so um, uh, the, the other thing that we've done is that we've used digital as a way to communicate across 57 countries for the First World War centenary. So we have three and a half thousand partners uh, in, in, in 57 countries around the globe working on the First World War centenary and all of that has been a process of digital delivery. So the delivery of resources, the events calendar, um, the uh, translation services, um, downloadable exhibitions, downloadable research lines, uh, assets such as um, all copyright and license free, images, film clips, audio history, that wouldn't have been made possible. We couldn't have run a global First World War centenary if it hadn't been for the ability to harness digital. So I think our human side is using digitally effect digital effectively as a tool. I think there are ups and downs and don't get me started on Twitter. How can you explain the world in 140 characters? It's a really, it's really bad for me that. That's warts and all of digital in the hu human in the digital age in the Imperial War Museum. Thank you. It's terrifying going last after interesting talks. I've been filling up an analog side with a mind map that I'm then going to go home and type up, which is very ironic on all sorts of levels. I want to, I approach this through the idea of human-machine interactions because I think that often we totally miss out the fact that we have relationships with and through machines, digital tools, systems, and these are in themselves emotional, fraught, human, and yet we insistently pretend that they are rational and features-based and about shiny gadgets, and they're not. And if you've seen anyone without phone reception or dead batteries, you realise that human-machine interactions are not a matter of rationality or <laughs> emotional self-control. And when I think about the future of human-machine interactions, there's two entwined anxieties that come to mind. I like to chase our anxieties. First, there's the tension between individual and collective existence. Technology connects us to each other as never before, and when it does this, it makes explicit the degree to which we are defined and anticipated by others. The ways in which even our ideas and our identities, they don't belong just to us. They're part of a larger human ebb and flow. Just follow a hashtag. Now, this has always been true, but 
Rarely has it been more evident or more constantly available for experience. Recently in human history, less than 100 years, an eye blink that the majority of the world's adult population has been literate. Most of history for most people is a matter of silence and darkness. And now, just in the last 20 years, we've had an even bigger revolution on the heels of this first, that through connected devices, through billions of connected devices that have massive penetrations even across sub-Saharan Africa and the world's poorest regions, for the first time, a majority of the world's population are active participants in written and recorded culture. It's astonishing, it's disconcerting, the crowd in the cloud is becoming a stream of shared consciousness. That's the first thing I think of, this human ebb and flow. And secondly, there's the question of how we see ourselves. Human nature is a baggy, capacious concept. It's one that technology has altered and extended throughout history. But I think digital technologies pose an increasingly anxious kind of challenge in asking us what kind of place we occupy in the universe, what it means to be self-aware, rational creatures. Our machines aren't yet minds, but they are taking on more and more of the ground that we used to carefully stake out as uniquely human. Reason, action, reaction, language, logic, adaptation, learning, the creation of things we find beautiful. And so we are beginning to ask what transforming consequences this extension and usurpation will bring. Now, I call these anxieties entwined, even though I can't quite say it, because they come accompanied by a shared error. And this error for me is the overestimation of both our rationality and our autonomy. In asking what it means to be human, we are prone to think of ourselves as individual rational minds. And we tend to describe our relationships with and through technology on this basis. We are isolated users whose agency and freedom are a matter of skills and reasoned options and drop-down menus. We are task performers who are existentially threatened by any more efficient agent. This is one view of human-machine interactions. But it's an account of human beings that gives us at once too much and too little credit. We know ourselves to be intensely social, emotional, intractably embodied creatures. Much of the best recent work across economics, psychology, neuroscience and other fields has emphasised the degree to which we cannot be unbundled into distinct capabilities, into machine-like boxes of memory, processing and output. Neither language, culture, nor a human mind can exist in isolation or spring into existence fully formed. We are interdependent to a degree we rarely admit. We have very little in common with our creations and a nasty habit of blaming them for stuff we're doing to ourselves. Now, what makes this urgent is the brutally Darwinian nature of technological evolution. Our machines may not be alive, but the evolutionary pressures surrounding them are every bit as intense as in nature and with few of its constraints. Vast quantities of money are at stake, with corporations and governments vying to build faster, more efficient and more effective systems to keep consumer upgrade cycles ticking over. To be left behind is to be unacceptably outcompeted as the philosopher Daniel Dennett, among others, has pointed out, this logic of upgrade and adoption extends far beyond obvious fields, such as finance, warfare, and manufacturing. The algorithm is proven to produce more consistently accurate diagnoses than a physician. It's both unethical and legally questionable to refuse to use it. As self-driving or semi-autonomous cars become more affordable and road legal, it's hard to argue against the ethical and regulatory case for making them compulsory, and so on and so on. Few fields of human endeavour 
are likely to remain untouched. In other words, machines are becoming stunningly adept at taking decisions for us on the basis of vast amounts of data, and they are getting better at this at an equally stunning rate. If we forget for a moment the hypothetical emergence of general-purpose artificial intelligence, we are handing over more and more of what happens in our world today to the speed and efficiency of unthinking deciders. And it's precisely because our present machines can neither think nor feel that this matters. We call them smart. We marvel at their powers. We giggle at Google. We paint pictures of a world in which they, not we, are determining what we do and how. This is what people do. We see purpose, autonomy and intent everywhere. We remorselessly ascribe agency to the world in order to understand it. But in doing this, in ascribing an agency that our tools do not possess, we misunderstand several fundamental points. Humans are not slow and dumb and heading for the evolutionary scrap heap. Machine efficiency is a very poor model for understanding ourselves. And cutting people out of every possible loop, the better to assure speed and profit and military success. This is an equally poor model for a future in which humans and machines equally maximize their differing capabilities. Our creations are effective partly because they are unburdened by most of what makes humans human. The broiling biological pot of emotion, sensation, bias and belief that is the bulk of our mental lives. We are biased, beautiful creatures, sometimes at least. Technology and intellect allow us to externalise our goals, but the ends pursued are those we have chosen. And so we must ask, do the incentives our tools tirelessly pursue on our behalf include human thriving, meaningful work, rich and humane interactions? Do we believe these things to be unachievable, unknowable or worthless? And if we don't, at what point exactly are we going to shift our focus? So if we want to build better machines, but also better relationships with and through machines, I believe we need to start talking far more richly about the qualities of these relationships, about how precisely our thoughts and feelings and biases operate, and what it means to aim beyond efficiency at lives worth living. What does a successful collaboration between humans and machines look like? I think, among other things, it looks like one where humans remain in the loop, able transparently to assess a system's incentives and either to influence its direction or debate its alteration. And what does a successful collaboration between humans mediated by technology look like? Well, we've been hearing the story of precisely that. I think we know what this means when we ask ourselves, it's characterised by the maximisation of all resources involved. Human creativity, particularity and questioning. Machine search, speed, processing and recall. An iteration involving all parties. And I think, above all, the recognition that efficiency is not an end in itself, but simply a measure of velocity. And so, finally, I think we should be clear that this is a very exciting time to be alive, not that we have much choice. And if there's one thing that our swelling collective articulacy as a species brings home, it's that people care above all about other people, for better and for worse. What we think, do, believe, fear, hate, love, laugh at, what we can make together. I think one of the few certainties we can cling on to when we try to look ahead is that our creations are going to grow far beyond our current comprehension. And for many people, how far and how fast is one of our most urgent existential questions. But I think that our best hopes of progress remain deceptively familiar, trying to understand ourselves better, asking what aims may serve not only our survival, but also our thriving. 
and then striving to build systems that pursue rather than subvert these aims. Thank you. So I think we have no shortage of uh, challenges and a uh, rich set of material um, to get us into a series of debates. But we've got about 30 minutes um, ready for your contributions and your um, questions. <coughs> we've got a couple of um, roving mics, so if you want to speak, uh, please uh, put your hand up. Um, and wait for the mic, if you don't mind, because uh, if you don't use the mic, uh, live streaming uh, participants will not be able to hear what you're saying. So, anybody like to kick off with a question or a comment? Uh, yes, in the middle here. Of the Um, thank you. Is it, is it working? Oh, there we go. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I was just wondering, I'm just going to pose a question that do you think the reason that this is this entire thing is um, this entire topic is happening is because we're not actually we're not unique in any form that hu we're starting to realise that humans do not have unique characteristics and therefore we're trying to search for a sense of self and I think that's probably the whole point of these debates is can we actually situate ourselves as something which we don't have any uniqueness and can we resolve that? I think Tom you might want the first comment on this. Well, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head of the most nagging of the nagging questions if you like that humans were once atop a pyramid with creation below them and God, who looked much like humans, at least in many traditions, standing, patting them on the back. And now we have a model in which we have emerged from nature. And are what exactly are an emergent property of matter? If we believe that, then at least theoretically we believe that we can represent just one step in a chain towards higher or other intelligences, or not. But as you say, that what we think of unique human capabilities are perhaps better described in terms of a spectrum of phenomena connecting us in one direction to the animal kingdom, to the story of evolution, where again and again through millions of years, small leaps of degree and then kind occurred in intelligence and rationality. And now we are building what appear to be other minds with that potential. But I think for me... The word unique is one we need to dispose of. Like the word original, when we talk about originality in art, as if to write something that would, by definition, be incomprehensible if it had nothing to do with anything else. When we say individuals are unique and deserving of respect, we do not mean that they have nothing in common with each other. We mean, as with Walter Benjamin on art's aura, that they uniquely occupy a perspective and a point in the space in time. And they are deserving of respect because of the way that coincides with the commonalities. And I think when I think of philosophers like Peter Singer, among others, who try to see our connectedness to animal minds, and potentially at least our connectedness to emerging, I won't say computer minds, but computer systems, perhaps respect not on the basis of uniqueness, but on the basis of the unique points of view we occupy within a commonality. This is something we can learn from our unprecedented connectedness to each other through technology. Oh, yes, sorry, the lady in the front here. Yeah.
when you made an analogy to the hyperconscious mind and the internet, do you think that the internet is helping us have more archival tendencies in our own brains, or do you think it's just sort of providing a, another device that can record things should we want to harness them or access them? I, I can't answer that from an, uh, any kind of neuroscience uh, perspective. But I could answer it anecdotally. Um, uh, I, it may be interesting to hear what other people feel. I think that I have outsourced the archival part of my brain to the internet. Um, possibly usefully in that it seems to me from reading about memory systems across history that all memory systems have understood a corresponding need to forget things because <coughs> they've been essentially... Uh, st about storage systems and uh, a sense that, that, that you don't have infinite capacity. So it may be that we're outsourcing a, um, uh, uh, something which can easily be done um, by the internet and, and that that's, there's, there's no problem in that. But I don't feel that it's encouraging, to answer your question, I don't feel that it's encouraging um, the shaping of kind of archival tendencies in the human mind. I feel as if it's, it's, it's taking over that, that function but I don't necessarily feel that that's, a, that that's a catastrophe. So do any other panel members want to make a comment on that from their own experience? Chris shakes his head. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think, I, I must say, I, I, I loved the discussion of memory and forgetting because it seems to me extraordinarily rich, especially when you consider the very basic fact that we remember in a totally different way to machines. It's rather unfortunate that we call what machines have memory and what we have memory because what's good for a computer is bad for us. Total, biasless, absolute, you know, itemized, copyable recall is a living nightmare for a mind. Um, and so my only answer to that, I suppose, is that people seek not only prostheses that are archival prostheses, but also, if you like, semantic prostheses, which is systems for making, you know, tools for making other tools useful. Google exists to make machines' memories useful to us. And so I think again and again in tech, we have the double prosthesis. This is something very, uh, that sounds like a weird theory, the double prosthesis. I just mean that you have the database or the archive, and it has a certain power in potential. But then what unlocks that and makes it actual is the, the mediator, the, the semantic engine, the search engine, the organizing principle of which we ask questions. And this perhaps is where the peril as well as the opportunity is because this intermediator that lies between us and the archive has a tremendous power that we may not be aware of. And if we just become, as it were, an asker of trivial Boolean questions, who don't understand what this prosthesis is doing, then, in a sense, our external memories are hostage to factors we have no, we have very little insight into, and organizing principles we don't even realize are being exercised on our own behalfs in the name of usefulness. I don't think you can catalogue a human response in the same way as the internet, in the sense that we are emotional creatures. We respond differently to different kind of chains of thought. So information doesn't sit at one level for us. It sits on multiple levels. And so I think whilst it's a useful uh, cheat, if you can't remember when Elvis died, and I was doing my paper round and I do remember when Elvis died, is, is that actually my, my, my whole thing about Elvis dying is the personal room, because I had it in the paper on my paper round, not that I remember, you know, the, the catalogue of his back catalogue of hits. So I think there's a difference between using, in the same way that we would use a process in order to organise it, that to me is how the internet feels, and then applying the applying the mind and the emotional character to it is what makes it more human. Uh, yeah, we've got uh, two questions here, and then I'll take one from the live stream. So two, two hands up. This lady here in the middle. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you. 
When I think of uh, what it means to be human in the digital age, I can't help but think of uh, the expectations that have changed for humans as a result of uh, new digital technology because I have access to machines like an iPhone and a computer and online databases like the Bodley and I feel like I and many other people are expected to produce more information and consume a lot more information than we've had be to before. And that information is coming from social media, the amount of errands I'm expected to run, the amount of networking I'm supposed to do, maintaining my online image, doing more research, emailing people across the globe, and, and just kind of dealing with all that very quickly and in a, lot of, and in a large quantity. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, it's, yes, easier to write an essay now, because I have that entire online database at my fingertips in minutes, but is machine consciousness kind of becoming like, our human orientation, and can human bodies and minds uh, bear the weight of this digital power and efficiency? That's a good question. Tom, do you want to go back? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I get to go it's first. Because I catch your so eye first. I think, for me, there's an important distinction to be made between what we are doing to ourselves through machines mm -hmm. and not to confuse that with some kind of inevitable law or logic of technology. We live in a spammy moment. Maybe in 20 years' time, people will look back on the first few decades of the 21st century as the age of spam, when human attention was woefully undervalued by digital services, because a lot of those digital services, like email, were birthed in an age when it was just like, hey, cool, we can send messages to each other for free. Let's make it so we can all copy each other in infinitely, because that's good. Or when business models essentially involved in trying to get people to click as many times as possible on whatever it is is on their screens so a small number of people can make money from marketing their attention to others. So before I go off on a rant, <laughs> what I mean is this is to do with, on the one hand, legacy infrastructure of things like email, and on the other hand, business models of pay-per-click advertising and so on. And I think there is a great undervaluing of human time and attention. What this doesn't take into account is what it means for people to work and think and process well, what people actually want. Um, I think it's going to take a long time before any kind of real backlash properly kicks in, but I think the future is not necessarily us dealing with more and more deluges of information and being expected to say more and more. I think on the one hand, technologies will evolve that do deal with some of this for us in smart ways. Uh, but on the other hand, I do think there will be a real pushback towards the revaluing of our attention as something that is at a premium. And we talked about you know, the tactile, about the physical, the irreducible physical object. Mm. And this is a really, really big part of people just saying, actually, I need to spend some hands-on time with this because I am a brain in a body not a pair of eyeballs and a jabbing finger. I am an embodied consciousness. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting you, you mentioned the Bodleian, and I'd recommend that you turn off your devices, come in, find an archive that nobody's looked at, and work on something like that. It will release you from your anxiety of information overload. And I think this is the problem, isn't it? Are people, you know, where do you find something that hasn't been said before, in a sense? How do you release yourself from that anxiety of, of, of influence. And we see more and more people coming in and working on collections which haven't been looked at before because there's a greater opportunity of perhaps being able to say something new. I, I, want, to, I want to kind of echo that. I think I have a great deal of faith that human beings will judge when digital is useful and, and when technology is useful and when it's left. Because if you look, 71 million people in this country actually physically visited a museum last year. Uh, you know, if you look at the sales of outside concerts, if you look at, uh, you know, sort of the way in which coffee, uh, coffee house culture is, is back, um, slightly more feminine than it used to be, but it's, is back. And I think there's a whole way in which humans will balance their interaction with technology. I remember when I first started in museums, I remember waiting for three o'clock in the afternoon. I was responsible for the inquiry service. And, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, that's when the post came. 
And then from three o'clock till six o'clock, I would open the post and put it in the trays of those people that were required to answer those inquiries. And we had an, a policy that your inquiry would be answered within six weeks. Would I want to go back to that? Absolutely not. What would, do I want to get the, th the 80,000 inquiries that we get every year, most of which are could be answered by them just doing a little more homework. No, but I think we will get that balance. And I have a, a great faith in human beings' ability to judge what's useful and what is not. So I think we had, uh, yes, a question in the middle here. Uh, and then I'm going to take one, I think. Anna has one from the live stream. Um, thank you very much, it's uh, really fascinating. Um, when I was listening, I was um, struck by the idea of um, that we were discussing things, th um, I don't know, using terms like through rather than with, how we can think about mediating, you know, uh, communication through technology um, rather than with. And uh, I was curious about that. I think also there was a, a mention made of nature and culture um, and the nature culture divide and you know even sort of implicit within even the the picture we've got up on the screen that there's this human and digital divide um, I wondered if uh, anyone could comment on sort of taking a more intraactive view of human and digital rather than this sort of interactive how can we mediate ourselves through if that makes any sense, I don't know. Anybody want to pick that one up? <laughs> Maybe you could say a little bit more about your view on that to kick well, off the... Um, it's just struck me that, that, um, that the conversation has been a lot around um, how we can mediate, how we can best use the digital as a tool to affect further human uh, communication or, or improve human life or quality of life and I was curious about sort of stepping away from just what can the digital do and how we intraactively work within the digital and the digital within the human rather than interactively one thing facing another and how can they face each other in more productive ways D does that make more sense to me? I, mean, I, I think there's a very important theme here about getting away from we use tools and we inviolate, isolated us, who is sort of non-permeable, uses tools to interact with all these other individuals. And I guess I tried to gesture towards that by talking about the degree to which this model of individual users of technology is, is not a very good description of the way that we are very permeable selves in many ways and the way that when we are holding a phone in our hand and we, we talk about prostheses, some people would go as far as saying it is a part of our mind. The extended mind hypothesis argues that to all intents and purposes a mind as opposed to a brain is best described by all that stuff involved in your thinking. Of course, this ties us up in horrific semantic knots when we try to talk. We are kind of irresistibly drawn back, I think, gravitationally to this idea of our seen bodies looking out from our skulls, doing stuff to each other. And this is a real problem. Maybe it gets in the way of us grasping properly what is going on when the ripples of a debate are running through Twitter, when the edit history of an article, when people are sort of processing and thinking together. I do think, I talked about anxieties, and for me that's partly because it just freaks people out, I think, to try and address the degree to which maybe their thoughts aren't their own or original. Maybe, you know, sort of the world is thinking through them, and if that sounds a bit too atavistic or spiritualistic, I think people are often very uncomfortable when they realise how they feel when you physically separate them from a phone. I do a sort of rather silly trick at the start of some talks when I ask people to unlock their phones and then hand it to the person next to them. And you have grown Googlers virtually bursting into tears <laughs> in panic at the thought of giving away 15% of their IQ to the person <laughs> next to them. 
and all I can say is that perhaps going forward, as we have an increasing intimacy with digital devices, maybe we will develop ways of talking that catch up with this phenomenon, that catch up also with it freaking us out. Because at the moment, there is, I think, a line, maybe arbitrary, where people do not tend to want implants. They don't tend to want RFID chips in their brains or skulls, at least not in Europe. In Japan, for example, for many reasons, including a sort of Shinto and animist tradition, people are a bit more comfortable with physically extending themselves. It's probably a gross, terribly simplistic generalization. But I think, you know, there is an anxiety here that points to perhaps a threshold we're crossing over, but that needs new generations of human beings to develop new and better ways of talking so we don't reflexively keep falling back on this individual, autonomous account of us doing stuff to each other with tools. Have you got the mic? Oh, okay, I'm going to take one from the live feed first and then we'll come back. Uh, um, we have two questions from the live feed. The first one's for Tom Chatfield. What is your opinion on actor, nectar, actor, actor network theory to frame human and computer interaction? Is it right to give human and non-human actors, technologies, the same level of agency? And that's from Erin Young. And the second question is from Yoav Hoshan. Will machines be able to understand human emotions? Do you want them repeated? Can I, can I not answer the one that they asked me? Because it's really scary. <laughs> I mean, I, for the moment, I, I find... Um, I, I don't think I have enough expertise on that to give a really great answer. The frameworks I find most useful tend to talk about human intentionality and transparency to inspection as important ways of not holding, of holding humans accountable for what machine systems do. And I think there's a very valuable distinction to try to maintain and a very important distinction to try to sort of wield if we are to have ethically meaningful conversations about accountability and systems. Transparency to inspection, predictability, um, and in a sense, freedom from tampering. Um, people at the Institute for the, the Future of the Humanity Institute, including Nick Bostrom, have written much better and more expertly than me on these conundrums. So maybe I'll cop out and recommend them. Um, <laughs> Wise. On, on the, the second one, I mean, the interesting thing, I, I just one little, in a certain, from a certain point of view, machines are already better than us at recognizing emotions. Um, there's a, an AI, AI company that works with video facial recognition technologies in America that has trained its tools to read emotional signals on people's faces. And then you get a bunch of actors trying to fake emotions and a bunch of real people doing uncomfortable things and experiencing real discomfort. And you have a kind of competition <coughs> between the AI on people's faces and then between trained human volunteers. The AI massively outperforms people. It's way better than us. Um, and the interesting thing there is, does it understand? No. Does a chess playing computer understand chess? No. The current models of AI, whether they're deep learning <coughs> or whether they're you know, sort of highly iterated pattern recognition and so on, they don't understand in anything approaching a human sense of understanding and they don't aspire to understand. But if we train them right, they perform better than us. That's what IBM's Watson does, among other things. And so for now, machines outperform us at stuff we've taught them to understand but they don't have a clue what they're doing. And that's the world we live in for now, a world of sort of astounding idiot automated savants who become better than us very rapidly at anything we've told them how to do. I think I'm loving my human imperfection at this moment on the basis of our discussion. Anybody else want to make a comment? I guess you said for now. And that <laughs> that's the, the scary is. bit. You know, what, how long do you think for now will last, given that the, you know, um, robots learning from robots may overtake us in a different kind of way? So I mean, everybody talks about Moore's law or Moore's observational tendency in transistor density, which is the doubling approximately of computer, of, of computer power approximately every 18 months. And people observe that what this means in practice is that in the next 
two years, the power of computers out there will increase by as much as in the entire history of computing to this point. And then again. And the point is that I don't have a clue, and other people don't either, because once you get into this realm of doubling, mm. suddenly new phenomena start to emerge. We see self-driving cars, we see machines reading and paraphrasing legal documents, making medical diagnoses, and starting to recognise facial expressions and recognise images. And people were confidently predicting they couldn't do this 10 years ago. True. At the moment, they don't have anything like what we think of as understanding, but the phenomena that will emerge from this doubling are inherently very hard to predict. And I guess one of the great questions is, how long will this kind of doubling continue? And how on earth should we be prepared for as many eventualities as possible while being in such total ignorance and disagreement over what is going on? I think you pushed that to the medium term, yes. <laughs> uh, OK, we've got, I think, a question uh, in the middle here. Uh, so we need the mic now. I'm sorry, I've been a bit <coughs> neglectful of the, the, the left wing, so to speak, or my left wing. But I'll, I'll look there next. Here? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I was very uh, uh, intrigued by the fact that at my age I have to learn all how to use this digital age and understand it. And I feel that people who have, of my generation, who have a different approach to this digital world from the youngsters who are born with it and learn to develop as human being immediately using digital as tools. And for example, it seems to me that uh, there is this big problem of being human when people have not had what we had at our generation, that we learn, for example, to compose, to write properly, and uh, to do some research and, uh, and use what, we, what we, we have discovered by ourselves. I can see, for example, that when I write emails, I'm not sure I'm very popular for that, but instead of you know just a sentence or two with plenty of typing errors and so on, I rewrite my email and I find that I compose much more. I enjoy writing much more than I did when I had to scribble and, and then make a big mark, you know, go back to this paragraph. So there have been improvement, but because I was trained earlier when I grew up as a human, a small human being, to, I was trained to do it without this mechanism. I, I, you know, I don't know exactly how to explain that, but I feel that digital age will affect young people uh, differently from the generation born before. And how can you talk about that? Because human, you know, you have the whole range of human being, the, the el you know, all, all the ages. For example, I'm sorry, but I just remember when years ago, uh, before you were born, uh, there was a possibility to have telephones where you could see your correspondent. And everybody thought it would be a disaster. And actually, it was not, uh, the idea was not, uh, the technology was there, but it was postponed by decades. Now, you can't see anybody who is not on the phone and looking at her. So, our machines, a digital machine, actually transforming us into different human beings. I'm sorry, I'm too long. So, any quick responses? Digital natives, digital immigrants, uh, etc. Et well, only, only, th only that I'm not digitally native either. 
And uh, what we found with audiences is that actually it's quite a split response because I, I, I can give you the example of the mother-in-law. My mother-in-law will not, she will not engage in this world. She won't have a computer, etc. And I can guarantee that her cost of living is higher than, than it is that if, you, if you, you can kind of shop on the internet because she buys everything at retail, high street prices and things like that. So, so but my other, my, my own mother is doing our entire family history research digitally and has embraced it completely. And, and we are being influenced by technology. We are changing, we change the way we work. Uh, we change the way that we interact with people. In some cases, it's quicker and more efficient. So certainly working globally has been transformed by, and, and working 24 hours, seven has been, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week has been transformed. I think the balance is in, in keeping the process as human. I, I have a friend who's the international director for Oxfam, and she's, she cannot send an email because she has 4,000 employees that come from hugely different cultural backgrounds where the content of an email can be a, you know, ranging from completely brilliant to very offensive, depending on who's reading it at the other end of the email. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages in, in, in all our human interaction. I just hope, for me, what concerns me about that the kind of quick, short digital, the Twitter and the, and, and the feed, is that it's reducing what should be really important human debates to, uh, to, to clip, clip quotes and, and things that are actually damaging and allowing people to say things that perhaps they would be wiser to forget. There's, um, a, there's a columnist I enjoy reading who recently wrote a column about giving up his computer and buying a typewriter and actually typing and how it it made him much more considered in what he wanted to, to write. And it was a sort of release from that jittery anxiety of constantly editing yourself, I suppose. It's interesting. Uh, just Quick one thing, point. I suppose. I find it quite interesting to try and, as far as one can, disentangle the experience from the tool when one is talking about older technologies. I enormously value <laughs> writing and... Um, physical books and annotations and one of the reasons I value them is not that the pen is inherently an object of you know great moral worth um, it is a piece of technology but it is associated with what you might call high friction time time of sensuous engagement time that is single purpose my it is a sort of synesthetic thing the brain is working differently when it is engaging with the physical and the tangible geography, there's not other stuff going on. And so the question for me then becomes, going forward, people are becoming different. Yes, the literate brain looks different from the illiterate brain. It literally physically grows. Of course it does. You know, we change our thinking when our brains, uh, our, our brains change in changing our thinking. But then what does a rich digital literacy look like? And I think we have to pay a great deal more attention to the different qualities and types of time and attention we need if we are to make the most of all our faculties and potentials, that we need high quality, high friction time, we need interpersonal time with people, we need in a way to see offline or unplugged time as in itself a resource to be you know, strategically, pleasurably employed. We need to see our attention as something that we have to learn to control. And if you know, digital literacy is a very, very complex box to unpack, but I think one thing that can be taught and practiced is to do with managing your time, your attention, the different qualities and types of time that people, ideas, and you yourself deserve. I think that I need to bring this to a close, otherwise I'm failing in my primary uh, duty. I can see there are lots of other possible questions, but you will have an opportunity to continue informally outside. Maybe I could just bring it to a close. I have to say we've got a rich uh, set of materials and thoughts um, that I know will, will provide um, a great deal of material to go forward into the programme. Just to finish on a few memorable phrases, um, I thought history must have a dustbin or else it will be a dustbin. Or outsourcing, I outsource my brain archive to the internet. I thought that was a very, very 
uh, good one. I think the whole question between interact interactions between the physical and digital, a very big theme coming through. And my very real favourite is that we live in a spammy moment. Um, <laughs> and so on that note, I wonder if I can ask you to thank all of our panellists for their excellent... <laughs>